Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Sam Chandon, the Silverstein Chair of the Shack Institute at the NYU School of Professional Studies. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. It is the top of the hour, uh, 3 p.m. in New York City, and we are going to hang tight for just a couple of minutes uh, to allow folks to make their way over from other alumni sessions that are being held today. Uh, so please uh, stay with us, and we will get going again in uh, just a couple of minutes. Thanks very much. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Sam Chen and the Silverstein Chair of the Shack Institute. Thanks so much for joining us. It is just two minutes uh, past the hour. Uh, we have uh, folks still making their way into our Zoom session uh, from other uh, alumni panels and discussions uh, that are being held today. So uh, just give us a couple of minutes and then uh, then we will get going. Thanks very much. Great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, I'm Sam Chen and the Silverstein Chair of the Shack Institute of Real Estate at the NYU School of Professional Studies. Um, and uh, I'll be joined shortly uh, by my colleague, Richard Florida, uh, who is the uh, faculty chair and distinguished fellow at the NYU Urban Lab, uh, which is a center for um, you know, urban research housed at uh, the Shack Institute. Uh, there are a number of really wonderful centers for urban research 
uh, around uh, NYU. And if you care about cities, you're doubtlessly uh, familiar with many of them. Uh, I think what differentiates uh, Shaq's Urban Lab is that uh, as a primarily commercial real estate focused program, uh, historically focused on um, in, you know, commercial investment activity, uh, development activity of large buildings, of cities, um, we're able to really uh, look at that intersection uh, between, uh, on one hand, um, you know, what is happening in the real estate market and the real estate environment um, and uh, the, the policy issues uh, that we faced in uh, ensuring that we are building competitive cities, uh, ones that allow for a diversity of uh, occupations and, and demographics. Um, and really bringing together policymakers, economic development corporation uh, leaders, uh, uh, local and state elected officials uh, on one hand, and then members of the real estate, again, development and investment community on the other, um, is something that I think makes Shaq uh, really special. The um, uh, Richard and I, in the early uh, weeks of the pandemic in mid-March, uh, really uh, had been talking about how it is that you know, we could engage with uh, alumni, uh, other members of the NYU community, our students certainly, and also with industry uh, to help advance uh, the discussion and help create some frameworks uh, for our thinking about um, you know, the impact of the pandemic on cities and particularly global cities, uh, not just New York, uh, Shanghai, uh, where uh, you know, CHAC and NYU, of course, uh, have a, a very substantial program London, Toronto, uh, where Richard spends uh, part of his time as a university professor uh, at the University of Toronto, um, uh, but how we could help to uh, really put a framework around uh, you know, very challenging and uh, certainly in the early stages of the pandemic, a very speculative conversation about uh, you know, the future of cities, uh, whether uh, people will choose to remain in cities uh, after the pandemic and what some of the city uh, challenges that, that cities would face uh, would ultimately be. Uh, and I think uh, what we, uh, our, our initial outing, and I know there are some folks you know, who attended that first program that we did together um, in, uh, uh, in the spring and early summer, uh, we actually offered a course for alumni uh, called Global Cities in a Post-Pandemic World. Um, and that was a fairly ambitious title at that point in time, uh, because uh, we were really just beginning to learn about all of the important things, not only the, the real estate and urban and cities dynamics, of, uh, of the pandemic, uh, but also I think we were very early in our conversations with epidemiologists uh, that have been critical throughout uh, the last several months, um, throughout uh, the, the last, I should say now, eight months, uh, in our thinking about um, you know, the underlying trajectory of the virus, uh, the ways in which it is transmitted, and then by extension, what that means for the design and layout and utilization patterns of cities, of subway systems, the subways you know, being a, a critical piece here. Um, so I know there are some folks who have joined us today that um, were, uh, were part of that class. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you and, and Richard as well when he joins us uh, with some of the updates uh, that we've got. We, we've come a long way in, in our conversation with epidemiologists and our understanding of the virus. We still have much, much further to go. Um, but we've also come a long way in understanding what the impacts uh, are and, and may be on cities once we see ourselves uh, on the other side of this. Um, what I would emphasize is that uh, as economists, as policymakers, uh, we have worked very hard to establish a, a very uh, a clear set of, of frameworks uh, for doing this analysis. There's too much noise in the market. Uh, for If you're just reading the general press, uh, discussions and speculation around the death of cities, uh, around on the, uh, the other extreme, how cities will return very quickly to pre-pandemic norms of behavior. We don't think either of those extremes is likely to prevail um, as, as the outcome. Uh, that being said, um, the, uh, I think what is undoubtedly the case is that certainly for myself and for Richard and for, for almost everyone at SHAC uh, and at NYU, uh, we are champions of the city. We believe in the city. We certainly believe uh, in, in New York. I've had uh, many opportunities to, to connect with and speak with uh, another NYU alum uh, who is also a the founder uh, of the SHAC Institute, uh, Larry Silverstein, um, and uh, after whom my own position is named uh, at, at NYU. I think you know, uh, you know, Larry's reminded me, and uh, we actually have a short clip that we posted to uh, the SPS Shack website where Larry talks about how you know he has lived through 
many crises in the history of New York City, including 9-11, um, and how uh, no matter how challenging circumstances have seemed in the moment, uh, New York City has always bounced back. Um, and we uh, all believe that it will again. That being said, there are some very specific challenges and headwinds that we face in the city. Um, in New York, um, when we're com making comparisons, again, across global cities, I think what we see is that some of the most pressing challenges that we face over the course of the next couple of years, some of these being uh, underlying challenges that have been uh, accelerated uh, by the, the pandemic uh, relate to the fiscal conditions um, in the city. And so uh, the fiscal health, the budgetary health of the city, of the subway system, the you know the the public transportation system and the infrastructure more broadly are, are all you know, you know very real challenges for us. So we started uh, you know this summer uh, with um, a, a discussion around in this short course. It was just four weeks um, that we were talking about you know the the likely impacts of the pandemic and the range of views to which you know all are credible and worthy of consideration. Um, I think where things have evolved since then, we launched two series. We understood that there was an incredible diversity of perspectives, uh, depending on whether people were in the office sector, the retail sector, uh, whether they were industrial property owners, um, or in some case, whether they were working in the policy environment, in affordable housing, uh, whether they were elected officials. And so we've launched two uh, public series in the months that have followed. One is every Tuesday at 1230 uh, Eastern time, and it's open to all alumni. So please join us. Uh, we host a different read CEO or chairman um, every Tuesday at 1230 for a different discussion. And it's been really amazing to hear you know, the diversity of perspectives when we've had sort of the CEO of one of the largest owners of apartment buildings in the country uh, talking about how his portfolio is performing uh, to the uh, CEO of a REIT that owns a significant number of hotel buildings um, in uh, the United States and abroad and to get her perspective uh, on, uh, on, on how real estate will perform. At the other side of this, um, I think what we see is that uh, you know there's also been a significant disruption to capital markets. What's the availability of financing, whether it be bond financing for cities, whether it be financing for the development of affordable housing. Um, and so uh, every Thursday we host our capital markets leadership series. Um, and uh, the capital market series brings in folks that are you know, at different points in the capital stack. Um, and so, um, you know, this week, uh, uh, just, uh, just yesterday, um, in fact, um, you know, we had a, a discussion around um, you know, the availability of uh, financing for the multifamily sector for rental apartment buildings. But we also um, you know, were uh, you know, really delighted and, and privileged to be joined, joined by Tammy Jones, who is uh, not only the CEO of Basis Investment Group, uh, but is uh, on the board of Matt Cali uh, Realty um, and is just been appointed to the board of uh, Crown Castle, which owns you know, an, an extraordinarily large portfolio of cell phone towers, um, uh, but is the chair of the Real Estate Executive Council, which is the I think preeminent organization for Black and Latinx uh, professionals in the real estate industry to talk about you know the disproportionate impact or uh, you know, the the diversity of impacts that we've seen from the pandemic, job losses, real estate outcomes, uh, the the health of cities when we're looking at different communities uh, within uh, the urban environment. So please you know do join us for those, and I'll if I have a moment. Um, you know, post a, a link to the replays uh, to all of those in the uh, in, in the chat uh, feature as well. But it's really been an extraordinary conversation between the summer and the fall. Uh, we will have hosted uh, roughly 80 events uh, with uh, uh, different executives and, and leaders in the industry, and we hope that uh, you'll join us uh, for for more of those or, or uh, for our capital markets conference where we have a three day period where we're, uh, where we'll really dig in on, on some of the issues. Um, to come back, you know, Richard and I really wanted to sort of then expand on the conversation uh, that we had had earlier in the pandemic around the global impact on cities. And so some of the points that I'll be raising and he'll be raising uh, really do hone in on what we're doing this fall, uh, which is a longer semester long course uh, called Global Cities. And uh, each week we're joined by a, a different colleague. Um, we've uh, you know, very much been focused on bringing in NYU alumni uh, and other members of the community. So actually, um, uh, let's see, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Rosemary Scanlon, uh, the, uh, the former dean of the, the Shack Institute, uh, one of my predecessors, uh, uh, who had been the, you know, the chief economist of the Port Authority, uh, talking about sort of you know, fiscal challenges and infrastructure issues um, in New York City. The um, I actually just got off of a Zoom call. Uh, 
a, um, and a pre-taping that I was doing, uh, our class on November 3rd um, is supposed to focus on housing issues in the city. Uh, but being realistic, uh, we uh, have anticipated that we won't be able to compete with on Tuesday, uh, November 3rd, uh, the coverage of the election results. And so that class is actually going to be on demand. So I was just on the line uh, pre-taping that class with Svenja Goodall, who is another NYU alum and a very good friend and colleague. If any of you have used uh, the Zillow platform, uh, Svenja is the chief economist of Zillow um, and again, an NYU alum, uh, but she sits on the most enviable platform of, of housing data of anyone I know. So I was able to get some really amazing insights and we'll be posting that replay. Uh, and again, this is something that all of our uh, alumni have access to uh, over the course of uh, next week. Um, and uh, we'll be joined by Mitchell Moss, uh, the head of the Rudin Center for Transportation. We'll be talking again about uh, you know, challenges facing transportation system and public transportation around the country uh, with a particular eye uh, to, to New York City uh, as well. So um, you know, there are a couple of things and I see some questions have, have popped up uh, in the chat. Uh, one is a, an easy one to answer. When was uh, the Shack Institute founded? How old or young is it? So Larry Silverstein founded Shack as the Real Estate Institute of the New York University in 1967. Um, and uh, it's been uh, incredibly rewarding for me uh, that uh, he remains the chairman emeritus of our board uh, and uh, remains so actively involved. He cares so deeply about uh, the work that we're doing at Shack. Uh, Marty Berger, the CEO of the Shack uh, of, of uh, Silverstein Properties, who of course works with uh, Larry every day, is also a, a member of our board. Actually, saw Larry briefly. He popped in for our virtual board meeting that uh, we hosted on Wednesday. Uh, but, uh, and of course, Larry is a trustee of the university, uh, but um, uh, 1967, so we're celebrating our 53rd year. Uh, we are one of the oldest, and as I understand it, the largest uh, real estate program in the world uh, by enrollment across our undergraduate program, which is ranked number three in the United States, and I think by extension, uh, the number three real estate program at the undergraduate level anywhere in the world. Um, um, and then our three different graduate degrees, uh, the Master of Science in Real Estate, the Master of Science in Real Estate Development, and then Master's in Construction Management, as well as our corporate and executive education programs. Uh, you may have heard that we receive a substantial endowment gift uh, to open a new center, a new institute uh, that will be based out of the Shanghai campus, um, uh, where we will be uh, rolling out in 2022 um, our first uh, real estate degree at NYU that is offered uh, at uh, one of our uh, global campuses uh, instead of just out of New York. So that, that's pretty special for us as well. Um, the other thing that's come up, I see a question here, you know, what about residents moving out? So this is actually one of the things that, um, you know, Svenja and I, again, the chief economist of Zillow and an NYU alum, we're talking about just before uh, this session. Um, and I think, you know, what you see there is that, um, you know, this question about where will people decide to live, you know, uh, and will they work remotely or will remote work play a significant enough role in uh, the way we think about uh, the office that uh, leaving the urban core becomes a viable option for a larger number of people that are in search of potentially, you know, uh, more space, good quality public schools. This is so central to our overall discussion around what happens with cities that it's actually, uh, Stella, thank you for the question, a, a great place to begin. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that, you know, I've really put to, that I put to Svenja and that you know, Richard and I have discussed at length uh, over the course of the last couple of months is, you know, are people really leaving the city in droves? You know, is there that exodus uh, to the suburbs uh, out of the Northeast and the Midwest in a way that sometimes, you know, the press headlines suggest? Um, and what I can tell you uh, definitively is that the data to this point do not substantiate uh, the conjecture that there is a mass exodus from cities. There is no doubt that we see many high profile cases of individuals that have the financial capacity and the flexibility in terms of their relationship to their jobs uh, or the type of work that they're doing that this summer passed, they were able to relocate to the Hamptons. Uh, that uh, certainly many high profile figures that have been able to you know, relocate either temporarily or permanently uh, to, uh, to Miami or, or to parts of Florida. Um, so that has been undoubtedly a feature of the market. When we look at a range of different data sources, uh, whether it be very short-term stuff, like uh, data from the, from the Postal Service on mail forwarding, 
how many people have forwarded their mail to an address outside of New York City uh, uh, or another major city. When we look at data on um, sort of you know, vacancy rates or the number of homes listed for sale or condos listed for sale in the city, it simply does not support the case that people have abandoned New York or, or other cities. The closest case that we have right now um, is uh, in San Francisco. And this is some fascinating data that I'd be thrilled to make uh, available uh, that uh, Svenja and I were just discussing. It's based on, on, on data from Zillow and listings. We've looked at, because you know, one of the challenges uh, during uh, the last cycle, particularly for first time home buyers, is we've not seen a lot of new home building and not a lot of new homes have been listed in the market. So there's been a dearth of supply of homes to buy. Um, and what that has, uh, what we've seen happen when we've looked at different cities around the United States is there are some in which the number of listings of homes for sale um, has increased substantially. Um, and, uh, but that is the exception, not the norm. So uh, what we see is that, you know, if you really believe that people in, you know, middle income for their city, uh, your working families are leaving the city permanently, these are not necessarily families that have the capacity to own two or three homes. Their ability to relocate to another market is in part dependent upon their ability to sell their most valuable asset, uh, which for, again, that median American family is going to be the home that they own. Um, and what we see is that Washington, D.C., Miami, New York City, the number of homes listed for sale uh, in some cases has gone up, in some cases has gone down, but we have not seen radical departures from uh, you know, the normal level of, of homes uh, listed for sale. The one exception that I saw in the data that Svenja was showing me was for San Francisco. And in our discussion, again, we'll post that, uh, that replay um, you know, in the coming week. The, you know, one, of the, uh, one of the critical things that's come up there, you know, what's different about San Francisco as compared to some of the other cities we were looking at? And uh, you know, our view at this point, I, I can't speak for Svenja, so watch the video, but uh, I, I think my interpretation of this data and what I'd like to posit as a potential explanation for what we're seeing, because it's been a near doubling of homes for sale in, in, uh, in San Francisco proper, is that you've got a combination of factors, extraordinarily high costs of living um, and, and housing costs, very challenging access to good quality public amenities, most importantly, good quality public schools. The schools themselves, sure, on the surface, they're free. To get access to a good quality public school, you need to live in a catchment area uh, that gives you access to that school. And what we see is that school quality becomes capitalized into the cost of the home. So if your house lives, is in an area that gives you access to a good school, that house is gonna cost more. That's gonna get capitalized in. Um, so very high costs of living, very co high costs of housing. Uh, but what we also see is that it is a market where you have been given a greater degree of location flexibility. So we see in San Francisco that, you know, given its concentration in the tech sector, there are a larger number of companies that have said, you can work remotely, potentially indefinitely. Um, or per perhaps e even permanently. Now, individual families are having to make decisions and choices. You know, if I work for my company and I never go back into the office, how does that impact my long-term career tra trajectory? If I'm not building meaningful relationships and expanding my network and seeing people, long-term, does that imply a different career trajectory for me than, you know, uh, if I am doing those things? And so there's, I mean, there are real choices that have to be made, but in as much as there is that location flexibility, what we see is that the convergence of those two things, you know, high cost of living, high cost of housing, um, challenging access to public amenities, and then on the other side, firms really giving folks a, a choice around uh, their uh, location preference, we see a larger number of people in the San Francisco area and in the Bay Area saying, you know what, if I can work for Twitter or Facebook uh, or Microsoft and I can do that remotely on a permanent basis, you know, and uh, without making a significant downward adjustment to my salary, I can move to Denver uh, or to Salt Lake City uh, or to you know, almost any other part of the country, then um, that's an opportunity that I want to explore. For a lot of people, it's not going to make sense. Uh, but what we do see um, is that uh, for a critical mass of folks, it does. And so in San Francisco, the number of homes listed for sale has risen appreciably. It's roughly doubled. Um, and so you know, there are examples of this. Um, what is also important to keep in mind is that during a pandemic, this is not necessarily the time when folks are going to say, okay, on one hand, I think I need to make a different location choice. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, is this the r exact right time to do it? We have to concede that the search for a new home has been constrained somewhat by the pandemic. You know, if I'm thinking about locating to a different city, but at least you know, in the short term, I'm not comfortable getting on a plane to go house shopping. You know, there are a lot of folks who say, I can see the home on Zillow and I can even do a 3D tour. I may not be comfortable purchasing a home in a market in which I'm unfamiliar based only on what I see on the web. And so the actual process of readjustment and rebalancing is something that happens over a much longer period of time. So we have to really evaluate over the next two, three, four years, how do the largest cities remain competitive? And it is not just about you know, folks thinking about a different location preference for themselves. There are also some significant headwinds facing cities. Um, and uh, those headwinds uh, you know, include a, a range of things. One is that um, if we have a different understanding coming out of the pandemic of the value of being located in the city, and by this I mean that you know, there's a different sense of you know, how important is physical co-location? You know, can I get deals done, whatever profession I might be in, um, you know, by being somewhere else. I think if anything, the pandemic has proved that while we don't love being locked in our homes uh, for eight, nine months at a time, we can get a lot of our work done. We can be productive contributing economic agents even when uh, we are working uh, in a way that is remote from one another. Now that will not be true for everyone. There are certain professions, certain types of jobs and occupations that ultimately depend upon close physical proximity and physical co-location. And that's going to be the direct delivery of medical services. That's going to be the person working in the restaurant. Um, it's not just low wage occupations. Um, in many cases, it is also folks that are in highly skilled occupations, but where the delivery of the service um, is ultimately something that you know, happens in person. There's uh, you know, room for flexibility here. We've seen the emergence of telemedicine um, as one example of how there is a subset of the medical profession and a, and a subset of medical services uh, that we've been able to deliver you know, quite effectively uh, online and, and by app. So a lot of our doctor's offices and a lot of the medical practices you know, have launched uh, more robust telemedicine services, more insurance companies have been willing to reimburse physicians that have provided telemedicine services over the pandemic, particularly in the early stages when a lot of those offices closed and where, you know, quite frankly, many people were afraid to go into a doctor's office or to a hospital, even if they needed medical care because they were more concerned about the potential for you know, contracting coronavirus. Um, so that is an example of a change, but there are a lot of professions across the skill spectrum, you know, that ultimately uh, will be delivered in person. Um, and so, you know, those are professions that don't offer the same degree of location flexibility. But for those that do, we have to see sort of how persistent is that. And so the basics of the framework uh, that I would uh, want to articulate for you uh, are first, you know, in particularly in the short term, what are the preconditions? for our being able to resume something that looks like a normal level of activity or a normal type of behavior uh, and engagement in the market. I suggest there that that is a, I call it a precondition because just because we can go back to the way that we lived pre-pandemic, you know, if a situation arises that allows for that, doesn't mean that we will. So there are two elements to this framework. The first is our thinking about um, the, the, so those essential preconditions. And the preconditions that I see are two. Uh, one is that we have a highly effective vaccine. Uh, but the second, uh, and by highly effective, I mean that I mean you can look at you know, a range of different possibilities here. And this is really where sort of economists reach the limit of their understanding and have to engage with the epidemiologists. We're talking about sort of, you know, is this a vaccine that um, you know, works for several months and provides partial protection? similar to sort of the kind of you know, protection we get from a flu vaccine? Or is it something that has a long lasting uh, protection uh, that is, uh, you know, that, that, that really works for everyone? Um, and we certainly have those types of vaccines as well. So where does it fall in that spectrum? Our precondition is one, a highly effective vaccine. But the other element of this uh, is that it's not only highly effective, but widely adopted. Um, and I think uh, what we see there is that uh, for various reasons, some of which are people's concerns, real or perceived concerns about uh, the degree to which a vaccine may be uh, pushed through the process too quickly, let's say, or that the proper vetting has not been done. In the attitudinal surveys, we see uh, that there are a large number of Americans, a substantial majority, I would say, of Americans that have indicated uh, that uh, they intend to delay uh, actually getting the vaccine once it's made available. 
So if you think about the preconditions, you know, for people feeling safe, for large institutions saying you're all coming back to work as being on one hand a highly effective vaccine, but one that is widely adopted, we still have a ways to go. The next element to this framework, and I'm going to introduce Richard because I know that's who you're waiting to hear from, not me. Um, but uh, the next element to this framework is that we're looking at lots of different possibilities and scenarios, whether it's economic modeling or anecdotal modeling. I group them into three areas. One I refer to as a reversion hypothesis. And again, even within the reversion hypothesis, there's many different permutations. But in this reversion hypothesis, um, you know, we're speculating and looking at scenarios in which behaviors of consumers, households, businesses refer, revert to pre-pandemic norms. Now, quite frankly, I assign a relatively low degree of probability to that reversion hypothesis, at least across the board. Second group of hypotheses referred to as the uh, acceleration hypothesis. And in the acceleration hypothesis, uh, we really see that what happens is that many of the underlying trends that have been at work uh, in you know, the continuing evolution of the economy are simply accelerated and sometimes significantly you know, by the pandemic. Um, and that's the one that I think is probably most likely. Uh, and it plays out in different ways in different industries and for different communities. Uh, the third uh, is the uh, uh, inflection hypothesis. And this is the one where in some segments of the economy, um, and in some consumer and household behaviors, we see that there are real changes in behavior that even after we've got that widely adopted vaccine, there are some changes in behavior, there's some new behaviors that emerge that persist and that you know, demonstrate real resilience um, and become long lasting features of the way that we think about you know, uh, the way that the economy uh, and, and households function um, and the way that ultimately then we think about you know, the value of and the role of cities. Um, and there, I would say that the longer the pandemic lasts, um, you know, the longer it is before we feel all comfortable going back to pre-pandemic types of behavior, the greater the likelihood that some of these truly new behaviors uh, will emerge uh, and will persist and outlast uh, the, the pandemic itself. So that gives you an idea of sort of the range of hypotheses and scenarios we're looking at. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I, it is such a privilege for me uh, to introduce my friend and colleague and uh, without doubt, uh, one of the world's leading urbanists, uh, Richard Florida. Richard, how are you, sir? Really great. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for inviting me to this incredible uh, seminar we're doing today. This is fantastic. Yeah, so we have folks joining us over Zoom. Uh, we also have a very large number of folks that are joining us over NYU's uh, Alumni Weekend platform. Uh, I was just, uh, Richard, telling them about the class that we're teaching together and some of the guests that we have, but also that I was just speaking to a common friend of ours, Svenja Goodall, the chief economist at Zillow, who, of course, uh, for, uh, for our audience today is of particular interest because uh, apart from being uh, an extraordinary economist and colleague uh, is an NYU alum. Uh, Richard, bottom line, I mean, uh, I, I should tell folks, point your browser to City Lab, uh, which Richard, of course, was uh, one of the founders um, at, uh, of City Lab uh, at the Atlantic magazine. Uh, he and his colleagues supported uh, City Lab over to Bloomberg now. So it's an, an important and honestly, I'd say the most interesting part of the Bloomberg platform. Not to say that the other stuff isn't, but you know, cities are dear to our hearts. Uh, do take a look at uh, the City Lab platform, in particular some of the things that uh, you know that, that Richard's posted and published there over the course of the pandemic. Richard, bottom line, is there an exodus from cities, and is this the death of cities? Well, can I I, I change my background for a minute to Toronto because I wanted to tell, especially the alums, um, just how popular NYU is, literally especially with college, like whatever it is, college get ready season, my kids are little. Like it's literally every week. I have another family from Toronto say to me, my kids really want to go to NYU. Who do they talk to? And I try to explain that you like, you know, NYU is really hard to get into. And it's not like that. You can go talk to a few people, but it's just really interesting how here in the great North, um, NYU is, is probably the single university that I get um, the most. So let me let me switch back uh, to New York. Given for this, um, the city. So the city of I guess the metropolitan area area of my birth, because I'm from Newark, and the metropolitan area that that I feel a very close kinship with, uh, particularly through my relationship with you, the Shack Institute, and in NYU. No, <laughs> no, this is just nonsense. I mean, 
It has so <laughs> much currency in the press. I mean, why does the conversation no, around the death I of cities persist? You know, other than being like a crazy conspiracy theorist, but I'm not that it's way worse in the United States. We don't hear any of this stuff. There is no one talking about the end of Toronto. In fact, people are saying Toronto looks stronger. Now, there are issues with the commercial corridor. We can talk about that in central business district and offices, but nobody's saying Toronto is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, it's, it's New York and then, okay, 90% of it's New York and then 10% of it's San Francisco. You know, and I just think there's a big anti-New York, anti-urban bias. I think that a lot of the New York papers principally the, po and I read the post, so because I care about sports. So the post has been particularly rabid on this. And, uh, you know, part of me can't think that there aren't some real estate developers, sorry, in the shadow, there aren't some real estate developers who think, you know, buying at the bottom wouldn't be a bad idea. So, so I, I don't know what it is, but I just find it really peculiar because there's no basis for it. And um, there's no basis for it. In fact, I mean, every one of these stories is just built on anecdote. What we know is about 400,000 people left New York City. What's that about? 5%? 4 or 5% of the population, yeah. Yeah, and that was a lot of students, like NYU kids, Columbia kids, kids other who said, I'm getting out of here, I'm going back home, though. I'm, or young people, like young people who were you know, working in, in a little apartment with five roommates, I'm going back to mom and dad. We saw about 100,000 change of address forms filed. So what's that about? 1%, 1.5% of New Yorkers filed for change of address. And those New Yorkers, though, do come from, you know, if you look at this great study that Professor Gupta did at NYU recently, you know, he showed some neighborhoods in Manhattan, you had like a third of people who left. But I mean, these are super like rich, she she areas like the Upper East Side, Tribeca, Brooklyn Heights. But most areas in New York, nobody, nobody, left. very few people left. And most people who left um, didn't leave permanently. That's why you didn't see the change of address forms. Um, you know, and I think, look, if you look at this, the people aren't leaving because of the pandemic. I think what you're getting is an accelerated migration of two kinds of people. One is people who want to avoid taxes. And I, I, that is a significant group. It's not, it's not trivial, but I think those people would have gone to Miami principally over the next three, four, five years, and they just accelerated those moves. And if you look at the Miami housing market, because we spend the winters in Miami, it's like places over 10 million that are selling, nothing else. It's like high net worth New Yorkers and people from LA and San Francisco. The second group, which I think is the bigger group, is people with kids. You know, my parents moved from Newark, New Jersey to a New Jersey suburb in 1960 when I was an infant. My brother was on the way. Uh, you know, there's 50 years of Americans at least moving to the suburbs uh, because cities are expensive. Schools are difficult to maneuver. You can do it, but they're difficult. Private schools are expensive and you have to commute. So I think those family formation moves were accelerated, but, but I, I don't, I think, no, there's no urban, there's no evidence that there's an urban exodus. You've probably heard that from Zillow's chief economist because they've looked at them. They've looked at housing searches and um, there's very little evidence that cities are gonna fall apart. Yeah. So uh, that being said, and uh, I think you, know, you and I and, and, and every New Yorker, uh, with the exception of perhaps the few that are writing uh, these pieces, are, are on the same page about this. Uh, th that being said, I think you, you and I have discussed uh, with many of our guests in the Global Cities class that you know, large cities, uh, New York in particular, we do face some very real challenges. Um, and there are some things that we are going to have to work hard to get right over the next couple of years. Um, one of them that, that you've described uh, so well and uh, you know, articulated so clearly in the new urban crisis um, is, uh, it relates to uh, housing affordability issues uh, and, uh, and the investment in urban uh, and inclusive communities. How have those challenges been exacerbated from your perspective over the course of the crisis? Well, I mean, you know, what we had in the old urban crisis was a crisis of urban decay and dysfunction. My, I witnessed this as a young boy in Newark as the city exploded into riots, as tanks and National Guards people occupied the streets, as this, and as business in the affluent population left. I mean, my, the factory my dad worked in closed. My mom took ads at the Star Ledger. It was ringed with barbed wire. And, and even New York, I mean, in the 1970s was in the midst of a terrible budgetary and economic crisis. So the old urban crisis was a crisis of urban failure and dysfunction and decay. The new urban crisis is a crisis of success. It's like tech companies, and you know, this is really interesting. Even in the midst of the pandemic, New York is still siphoning off tech companies from San Francisco. I mean, still, I mean, still more tech companies are moving to New York. Young people moving in droves to cities, the, what I call the creative class, artists and musicians and entertainers. Um, wealthy people moving to cities, uh, you know, almost every, I always say this to you, Sam, and the folks listening in, almost everyone I know who bought an apartment in the past five years in New York was older than me. 
I mean, and they're coming from, you know, Toronto or Montreal or Berlin or Stockholm or Washington, D.C., and, you know, probably downsized and wanted to have a little pied a terre or a place to live in New York. So all of those things put incredible pressure on land, land prices and real estate prices, drove prices through the sky. And now you add in investors who are looking at this as a new class of asset and created this horrific ga a gap. Cities were no longer for the middle class or for the rich. And uh, this incredible affordability, you know, if I would show you a slide of the most unequal cities in America, they would be like LA, New York, San Francisco, Boston, all the places that have experienced the greatest urban renaissance, if you will. Uh, so yeah. to fit into that, you know, the, I think we, we have alumni all around the world and certainly based on house prices. And if we look at house price trajectories in isolation, you know, Toronto seems pretty unaffordable. It's horribly unaffordable. I think on, a, on, if you look at what is called the median multiple, which looks at median housing prices against median incomes. Vancouver is second, was second to Hong Kong. My hunch is Hong Kong is experiencing some decline right now. And Toronto was in the top five. So yeah, I, I think that the problem in Toronto is even worse than New York in, in some, I mean, Toronto has publicly provided healthcare and it has uh, provincially supported education. And there isn't as much of a, a abject poverty and social distress and there's much more social cohesion in Toronto. So that said, um, but there's no supply. I mean, Toronto just doesn't build as much house. I mean, I know this sounds odd thinking about New York, but it just doesn't build as much housing as New York. So, and and in Toronto, as you know, because you're Canadian, um, I'm an American who lives in Canada. Um, we make quite a pair, Richard. What? We make quite a pair that way. Yeah. Uh, for folks listening in, I mean, who don't know the Torontonian scene, uh, most people in Toronto want to live in a single family home. And, and so even though there was a lot of condo building, that condo building is either very young and it's small units. If there's not, you can't go out and you can, but it's hard to find a wonderful condominium where you could raise a family. They're small units, they call them bachelors. They're mainly for people in college or right out of college who may take them or double up in them. Uh, and, and, and they're marketed at overseas investors. So, so most people, and I'm not just talking about affluent professional Canadians, I'm talking about new, new Canadians, immigrants. Now they may live further out because that's 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 what they prefer and it's more somewhat more affordable. But yeah, most of the action in Toronto, people want more single family home. In that sense, it's more like, I hate to say, it's more like a, a Sunbelt city than a New York or a, or a Miami uh, where people are used to condo living. Uh, there isn't a big demand for that. So there's very few single family homes and the prices go up. The, the, the median price of a single family home in, in the city of Toronto is now about $1.3 million Canadian. It's a lot of money. That's like San Francisco. That, well, without adjusting for currency, it's about like San Francisco. The um, you know one of the uh, inevitable challenges that cities are going to face, uh, and you know I think we're acutely aware of this in New York, uh, relates to uh, you know, our, our fiscal outlook. Uh, New York City for the current fiscal year, uh, it looks like we'll have a budget deficit that is comparable to twice what the entire state of Texas uh, will, will, will face. And you know, separately, the MTA is talking about potentially drastic and draconian cuts. A lot of this you know, uh, is a function of um, you know, are not anticipating in, in the current environment significant external, and by this I mean federal support for cities. Yeah. Um, are there good options for us in thinking about managing um, you know, our, our fiscal outlook without federal support? No, I mean, no, I don't think so. I think that without federal support, the impact on not just New York City, Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, maybe worse, Toronto. Uh, the New York isn't alone in this. And I don't think it's just cities. I mean, I, I, suburban budgets, large suburban budgets. I mean, everyone's tax revenues have been devastated, right? Uh, so, so everyone has this problem. And it, it seems to me that this is where I think with a, with a change of, likely change of, you know, I, no one has a crystal ball, but with a likely change of administration, my hunch for a Biden-Harris administration, job one has to be a bailout. And I would argue that the bailout shouldn't hand over money. Sorry, New York. It shouldn't hand over money to New York or Boston or Seattle or LA. It should come with a lot of carrots and sticks. And those carrots and sticks should encourage people to do the right thing. So there's an opportunity here to set things right, right? There are a lot of claims on New York City's budget and other cities' budget, which are political, we'll say, small p political. This is a time that you can set things right. And you can also say to folks in New York, 
look, the city isn't going to solve this problem on its own. It, and, and here, you know, it's basically the problem is the allocation of activities across the metro area. People are working in New York. They're just not working in the city. They're working in where they live. So you have to solve this problem on a metropolitan wide basis. We're not going to give you the bailout or we're not going to give you access to the bailout. And there's a precedent, you know, when Amazon had that god awful HQ2 thing where they went, made people compete and for billions of dollars of incentives. Uh, cities and regions and metropolitan areas really put their minds together and worked across these municipal boundaries. So I think you have an opportunity in, in the world now with the right kind of bailout, not a handover of money, go do things the old way, to say to cities and suburbs and rural areas, get your act together, figure out what you want to invest in as a team. Uh, overcome this horrible, inefficient fragmentation you have and get with it. And, and look, it's going to be hard and it's going to be painful. But the way, the way I look at this for folks being part of this is the, the last analogous thing to this was deindustrialization. And there was a time when I was a boy that New York was a manufacturing center. And when I went to Soho for the first time, there were factories. And there was the commission of Soho manufacturers to throw out the artists. And Tribeca was filled with factories and the meatpacking district was a meatpacking district. And that all went away. And it was horrible. But think about how New York City, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, think about how New York City was rebuilt in a post-industrial way. Most of those places became fulcrums over time of new industries, new activities, creativity, arts, culture, music, technology-based companies are in a, in a lot of those old buildings. So yeah, the, the loss of office work and the packing and stacking of, of functionary, office functionaries in big towers, that's going to be painful. And you know, the support economy around that's going to be painful. But look, I, I hate to say it. I mean, you, you know, you run the Shack Institute, Sam, so maybe you want to weigh in. Those were always the parts of New York that seem sterile and boring and one-dimensional to me, like the midtown finance or the or the old financial district before it was remade. It was Greenwich Village and Tribeca and Brooklyn. You know, you we can name these neighborhoods that seem vibrant seems to me we have an opportunity to remake New York City's neighborhoods, Midtown. The financial district is already on its way after 9-11. You could make these neighborhoods better, not worse. Like the loss of office jobs doesn't have to make New York worse. It's going to be a budgetary impact that we have to figure out. But at New York, and then I think the other issue is transit. I do think you're not going to have as many people commuting on trains and transit for maybe ever. And that means transit has to be rethought less as a way to move office workers in and out and more as a way to move people around. So, yeah, I think those are the big questions moving forward. Not, not people leaving the city. It's, it's com commercial real estate and transit. The, uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned to folks is that, you know, the, the, before, before you joined us, the um, transportation issue uh, is uh, so significant for us. And in my own research, although, you know, I, I wish I had much more data to substantiate this than, than I do, and it will take a, a little bit of time. We're seeing very different business resumption plans for, uh, uh, for, for office tenants, depending on the degree of dependence on the public transportation infrastructure, and whether the risk of the subway system and congestion related to the subway system is real or perceived, set aside that question. At the end of the day, people are anxious about getting on the subway. And so um, you know, we see sort of some very different outcomes uh, in a Dallas versus a New York, uh, where there's transportation autonomy to a greater degree one than the other. You know, you are an avid cyclist. I know this because I've seen you come into a shack with uh, with your bike helmet in your hand. Um, the uh, we're not going to get everyone onto a bicycle, but you know, if if the MTA makes the kinds of cuts in service that you are being you know floated as potentially unavoidable. How does that change the fabric of the city? How does that, that would seem to me to you know, fundamentally change the experience of being a New Yorker? Um, and I want to ask about it in the context of also what are 15 minute cities? Sorry, go ahead. Places close to established economic centers. Let, let's say that you take a 20% reduction. I'm making this up 20% reduction in office tenancy, maybe. I don't know. Uh, not all of, not everybody, but between 20 and 30 and 40%. There's still going to be a lot of people working in Midtown, a lot of people working in the financial district. And there's going to be a lot of industry there. There's going to be a lot of finance, a lot of real estate, a lot of media, a lot of high tech. That's the neighborhoods that they want to be in and around. Uh, if you're within walking and cycling distance, though, the neighborhoods, housing prices are going to go up. And maybe they're going to go down for a short amount of time, but they're going to go up. And, and, and those neighborhoods are going to be highly desired because you don't have to get in the subway or you don't have to get in a car. And we know that one of the things that has driven gentrification uh, is, is so, so the area around NYU is going to go up in, in value for sure, 
with, without a question, because people can walk and bike and it's a lovely residential neighborhood as well as having NYU and all sorts of other activities. Um, you know, I think there's an opportunity and New York has already been on this to really remake the city around what, what you call these 15 minute neighborhoods. You know, like I was saying, I never liked these monolithic office neighborhoods. I always found them kind of, cold. and when I say cold, not only windy, they just seemed cold, they didn't seem human scale. Uh, and I'm not an architect, I'm an urban, urban planner. So I kind of always liked the more mixed use or residential neighborhoods. And I think you have a chance to make them. You know, we had this in our class, we had this conversation with folks in the financial district, you'll remember. And what they said is, you know, rebuilding after 9-11 was fantastic because this is, Jane Jacobs is the most famous, everyone listening in, the most famous urbanist of all time. I got to know Jane when she was older. She moved from Scranton, Pennsylvania to New York to Toronto. I got to know her when I moved to Toronto. The one thing we fought about is she didn't believe the financial district could be remade as a mixed use neighborhood. She's like, who would wanna ever live there? It's one thing we, we fought about. Actually it has, as we learned in that class, right? From people down there, it has been about a quarter of the people who work there, about a quarter of the people there live there. Pretty good. Uh, and I think you could rebuild uh, this, the office neighborhoods as less office and more residential. When you say 15 minute neighborhood or what I call a complete community, it's a place people work, live, their kids go to school and they can structure their everyday life. The place that's furthest ahead of this is Paris. The mayor of Paris wants to make the entirety of the city of Paris a set of 15 minute neighborhoods connected by transit, connected by cycling networks, uh, connected, reduce car traffic immensely, right? So that everyone can live in their neighborhood. And, and on a personal note, you know, Toronto, uh, my wife said to me the other day, I really like our neighborhood now. And I said, I do too. And, 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 and I said, but why? Uh, because she's much more observant. And she said, because more people are here now. And I said, well, explain that to me. She said, well, you used to go to work. A lot of the guys in the neighborhood would go to work. The kids would go to school. Uh, people would take vacations, whether it's a ski trip or a trip in the summer. Now everybody's here. And, and she said, it's great because we all got to know, this is really interesting. We all got to know one another. We didn't know one another before the pandemic. Now we're all friends and we visit one another. And, and as hokey as this sounds, Yet just yesterday, somebody brought muffins over the house. Like, so this phase shift from this anonymous urban gentrified neighborhood to this kind of 1950s community neighborhood, that's what a 15 minute community is. So what does that mean for the value of scale? And when we think about sort of what makes New York so amazing, one of the key features is that we've got sufficient scale uh, to be able to offer an incredible range of amenities and services and opportunities. You know, there's the you know, the, uh, you know, the complementarity of firms uh, that are co-located in the city. If we break this down, if everyone is concentrating their work and uh, life activity in a relatively small radius, does that level the playing field a bit between the biggest cities and the ones that, uh, you know, that are maybe just a little bit smaller? Well, let me give a two-part answer on that. Hmm. If the United States allows its major cities to fall apart, so if there is no federal bailout, if New York and San Francisco are left to wither, that will be the gravest economic competitor. This isn't about people wanting to live in, this is what you said with complementarities and conglomeration. This isn't about people choosing to live in a lovely little city, Janet Greenwich Village neighborhood or a lovely place in San Francisco. This is about economic competitiveness and innovation and productivity. If we break that down because nobody wants to help, we will undermine US competitiveness and that competitiveness will shift to Europe, to Canada, to Asia. Because someplace, call it China, will figure out that there are these dynamic complementarities that come from clustering, that those are the motor force. So what I worry about in the US is not where people choose to live. It's if we totally screw this up and don't undertake what we need to do, we're going to undermine our, our source of economic productivity, of innovation, and, and our standard of living. We're going to undermine American standard, not just undermine its cities, undermine its standard of living. Um, I think that we can get that scale, even if people spend more time in their neighborhood. I think that what we're really talking about here, to be honest, is the unpacking of, of one activity, which is central office work. That's it. I don't think people are going to spread out. I think people are still going to concentrate in Manhattan and Brooklyn. There's still, we know that talent, all the research we have is that the economic spillover effects come from the concentration of talent, much more so than the co-location of firms. That talent will still co-locate. It may be a little bit younger. It may be a little bit more artsy. But that's and less pied a terre affluent people just taking advantage of amenities. So, but I think what we're talking about is the reallocation of office work. And I think some of that is going to reallocate away from the city. I, I don't think it makes any sense to pack all that office. I really don't. 
from an economic, from a point of view of scale, it, it can be that some of that work, 20 to 30% can be more distributed. There can be less commuting, less time wasted. So then we have to figure out the revenue implications of that. Like, how do we gap fill what that means? But, you know, let me give you another point of view. I'm from Newark. Newark used to have an office commercial corridor. All, most of that stuff, with the exception of Prudential and Audible, was sucked up by New York City. Better, better to me that Newark gets some life back and Jersey City gets some life back and Bridgeport, Connecticut gets some life back than everything goes on in Midtown in the financial district. New York's going to be fine because it's going to attract really smart and interesting and innovative people. It has great universities, NYU, Columbia, others. So I think we're talking about how do we manage the re relocation, relocation of, of office work. I really think that, and, and what you said, the transit piece. How do we figure out how to make transit work when there's less office worker demand for it in the short run. Yeah. And if folks are particularly interested in that transportation piece, as I mentioned, Richard and I are having as a guest in our uh, Global Cities class uh, just a few in just a few weeks time, Mitchell Moss uh, from uh, the Rudin Center for Transportation at NYU, just truly brilliant um, and will offer some incredible insights into what we need to do with our transportation infrastructure, what, what the, you know, what the degrees of freedom are that we have to actually address, you know, a set of challenges that have you know, certainly been exacerbated by the crisis, but quite frankly, the seeds of some of the fiscal challenges facing the MTA uh, have been long in the making. Um, Richard, this has been such a privilege. Uh, we are just about out of time. Thank yeah. you so much uh, for joining me. Thank everyone. My email is florida at creativeclass.com if you want to follow up. And by the way, Mitchell is not only smart as a whip, he's hysterical. Like he's yeah. just one of the funniest <laughs> people, wittiest people I've ever met. So do tune in. Th Sam, thanks for having me. It's delightful. Thank you. And, and, and folks, again, you can reach me at chandon at nyu.edu. Uh, but please, uh, you know, visit that uh, link I shared. Uh, if you want to sign up for uh, our public list, uh, Shaq hosts about uh, 80 programs uh, this fall, uh, almost all of which are uh, open to uh, alumni and friends. Uh, so we would love to see you there. Uh, and uh, this is just a, a small uh, glimpse of uh, the kinds of issues that we're tackling in the way in which you know, our faculty are, are, are engaging in New York City uh, and in policy, both in the United States and abroad. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of Alumni and Parents Weekend, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.